This is smithy.tv. Hi, welcome to the Tony Rosato Show. I'm Tony Rosato. We've got a great show for you today. We've got one of our uh, special guests with you today. Uh, our guest is Ryan Goldhar. Hi, how are welcome you? Ryan. Hi, Thanks, Ryan. Tony. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Thanks for doing the show. My favorite part is having random shows happen, you know, spontaneously. It's yeah, this happened spontaneously. We were supposed to have a guest. We couldn't make it today. So Ryan jumped in and uh, has filled the gap. And we say thank you. I fill many gaps. It's a uh, pleasure <laughs> being this size. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, your dad is Larry Goldhart. He is. Sometimes I call him dad. Most of the time I call him Larry. For people who don't know Larry Goldhart is, he's the head agent here at the Characters Talent Agency and one of the greatest agents in the world. And uh, he's just, I'm lucky enough to say that he's my agent as well. I'm biased because he's my father. <laughs> I, I don't have to like him. I just happen to like him. What's it like working for your dad? It's not just working for him. It's working with him. Like I said, right. we share a desk, so we face each other. We look at each other's eyes constantly. It's like this longing. Right. Sometimes I play footsie with him. But, uh, <laughs> but generally, it's great. I, I, what ends up happening is we have the same personality. And we right. have the same voice and intonation i don't look a thing like him no but I don't but if you pick up the phone we sound a lot alike right and just over the years i've had his intonation or or marvin's my uncle's we can do God like we him. have a, a we have a gold heart voice right so we can like go back and like you know like we'll do like the raccoons remember the cartoon the raccoons and you, but dad i want to play with ralph and the other raccoons <laughs> so we all all of us can do that including right. his son and including you know, so and your sister works here as well. My that sister's here too. She's uh, she's been here now for for over fifteen years as an assistant and but an agent for over ten. She's become one of the, uh, the strongest agents in Toronto. Right. And, uh, and, and you, I, get, you get together as a family and sort of go over what you know. What, how are we doing? How's it going? <laughs> no, we just get together as a family for dinner. But you know, once a week, we just you know we're we're lucky enough to be able to see each other every day, and then still right. want to see each other. Like on a Friday night, we have right. a nice big family dinner. There's usually like 17, 18 of us every Friday. Wow, um, really. I mean, and it's not a religious thing. I mean, yes, it is because it's, you know, we're Jews and, and it's two, a... You have two a, sisters, right? I do, but she, my eldest sister lives in Vancouver. Right. Uh, her husband and her and their family uh, are in our business as well. He's a producer and a writer. Um, so television moved them to Vancouver more than 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're in town, they're also at Friday Night Dinner, you know, so it's a big night. We have, right. uh, you know, but lots of kids and... Now, people worry that uh, your dad is in the verge of retirement. Is he retiring? No, he's soon? gonna unfortunately die at his desk, and I'll be the one to find him. <laughs> he, oh uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, oh I know gosh. it's an awful thought, but he's that's joking. It is his personality. Uh, we are going to be the agency hits forty-five years this at the end of this month. God bless, Muzzle Top. Thank you, and uh, you know he started it. He, he left the CBC in nineteen sixty-nine, and. You had a prior agency to this agency, right? Well, no, it was the same agency, but the agency's name changed. The name was changed. What was the original name? The original name was the Ugly's Talent Agency. The Ugly's Talent Agency. I'm uh, glad it changed its name. Well, Actra kind of forced that to happen. Did they? Yes, there was. Um, they had a, a bit of an issue with with us calling the actors, client actors, actors ugly. Yeah. I said, they can call themselves that, but we as an agency don't want to represent. So others. they opened a thesaurus and said, oh, let's look under ugly. And that's where character came from. And and so, yeah, so 45 years in the business and, and uh, it's pretty terrific. And, you know, it's still yeah. it's still one of the biggest in Canada. We have you know, a spot in, uh, in Vancouver as well. And So with the name of characters, do you look for certain character actors, actors who well, have I, particular characteristics that are not quite... Well, as, a, as agents, we look for what we hope are people who are going to work in any right. fashion. I mean, like the whole point is to look for people who we think, whether or not they've already had a career, and so we, you know, we work from that point or from scratch looking at a young talent, a, you know, a teenager or an early 20-something right. who, um, who just has something special about them. And uh, are they character actors? Not necessarily. You know, you want a hunk or a, or a beautiful girl, or you go for someone who does fit those other roles. Someone right. who, you know, isn't the good-looking person, but is funny and is able to just, you know, get those spots. So there's no particular person we look for, but the name has stuck for this long. That sort right. of you would think that. But, yeah, I was just wondering. Now you're in Vancouver in L.A. as well. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have an L.A. office, but we spend a lot of enough time there and uh, yeah. and have enough. Uh, relationships with the agencies and managers in Los Angeles that we, you know, we've 
sort of feel like we have a home there. But. Would you set up a home there permanently at some point? Do no, or not. I, I don't think I don't think we need to. I mean, we're we're definitely a Canadian business, and we rely on our relationships there anyway to to meet the demands of of international television and film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of American shows shooting in Canada that uh, you know they want a piece of this pie too, as much as we want our performers able to cross the border and go and you know be on a hit American show. So, you know, we play we play a lot of politics, but there's a you know it's it's all about relationships. I don't think we actually need an office there to be uh, to be frank. I mean, mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's just the way the industry goes. I mean, we're happy where we are. I think there was a time many years ago we could have. I mean, Larry was I think offered a job to work at an agency there, um, and we probably would have had a, a much different life, a much more lucrative right. American lifestyle, agenting style life instead of the Canadian, which was, we did, you know, you make a good living, um, but not necessarily, you know, not in the multi-millions that some of the agents do by having these right. A-list talent, right. where there's no list talent in Canada, because even though you have the quality of an A-list performer, you know, you're not offered your next job, you're still auditioning. Do you help, you know, Canadian actors get agents in the United States? Absolutely, yeah. You do? Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we sort of gauge who we think would be the best fit for that performer, whether or not we think they have conflicts, of course. I mean, conflicts are always a part of, of our industry, which is sometimes just actors, uh, you know, you know, we want to be able to push our performers the best that we can. And if we have two people that are exactly the same, the only reason you sort of take on someone who's a conflict is because the other person is working. Because if you have two people who aren't working, then who do you concentrate on? And, and wouldn't that one person feel feel like they weren't necessarily getting the attention that they should deserve. Right. And they do both deserve that amount and get that amount. But it's perception. And right. you don't want your performers to feel like they're not being looked after. Right. And and that's the key for us is we want to make sure that they feel that they're being looked after and we are looking after them. Right. Yeah. Now you did something else before you joined your father's agency. You I did a casting company, right? Yeah. I ran a uh, casting link and then what became Casting Central which was Toronto's biggest uh uh, casting studio. What made you change your mind? Like, you know, years of there? persistence. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I did that for almost ten years. Actually, about ten years. I had that company. And what's it uh, like to be in the casting industry? Uh, the casting business is interesting. I mean, what I love about it is that it's always changing, and uh, the technology, unfortunately, changes constantly too. And so, when you're running studios, you've got, you know, you, I started. We had VHS cameras. You put a tape in the t- camera. You you press record and and you press stop and then you write down the time and then you go to the next actor. You have a, a slate machine, but if you were doing self tapes, for instance, the fastest way to get a tape done was you do the scene, and if you had to do it again, you rewound and taped over it, and then you so is that good? Is that the one we want? Okay, okay. Now we'll go to the next scene and then you do that over and over and you rewind to the point where the second the first scene ends. You sort of give yourself some space, maybe two or three seconds, so that you have some rewind editing room. Mm-hmm. And then you eventually have a tape, and it's got like your name and the agent and the contact on there, and then you FedEx it off. And then the technology changed where we went from VHS to DVD. So you now have these new machines that suddenly you could kind of do takes. You didn't have to re-record over the old take anymore. And I mean, it became this great device. Mm-hmm. But then the digital age happened where even though DVD is digital, um, when you can record and send things uh, digitally, like online, like through an email or through a website, well, suddenly uh, you can do as many takes as you want and then it's clean. It's like it's the, the picture is exactly the way it was when you shot it. You just click the take you wanted and you send it off into the world. Uh, editing is much easier um, it doesn't change the audition process. I mean, to me, the best auditions are still usually your first takes. Your first instincts are usually your best takes. Right, but you can keep all the takes. But you can keep all the takes and then sort of watch them back. But it's, it's time can, it, it, the time doesn't change. A half hour is still a half hour. An hour is still an hour for the amount of time it takes to do an audition. Or if in the audition process for casting directors, well, I mean, then it's, it's simpler still because you're just pressing stop record. You record what? what take it was instead of what time it was. How do they choose the actors that read with actors when they come in for auditions? Oh, readers? Well, readers are, readers, you know. yeah. 
Uh, some casting directors read themselves. Yeah. And then some will hire other performers, you know, normal, you know, like, and the union has rates or if there's, you know, uh, for it to being a reader. So uh, readers get paid for that job. Um, you know, it's rarely volunteer, but a lot of them will just to get the experience of being in a room and seeing what the process is like. You learn to be a fly on the wall. You get to see... Uh, sometimes being a reader makes you a better actor in ways because it allows you to see every audition. You have a room and you see the next 40 auditions, you see three roles and you see 10 people come in for that one role and every performer is coming in with a different take. And it's not necessarily up to you to decide what the best take is, but what it is, is you get to see the choices. You get to see where actors are thinking and what kind of mindset they're in when they read that script and said, Oh, this is the way I should say that line. Right. I mean, it could be a one-line role, mm -hmm. and of course, that two seconds of time is, you know, sometimes uh, the the casting director will say is because it's a one-line role, an actor role, they'll say, you know, just um, just say it three times, three different ways, and you go in, you'll say, "Would you like fries with that? Would you like fries with that? Would you like fries with that?" So every take is different. I mean, the the intonation might not change, but your voice, your body, everything about you changes. And then you say, thank you, and they leave the room, and they'll say, take that off. Or, oh, no, that was great, and just sort of mark that. I mean, there are, you know, there's a hundred reasons why right. people, you know, do the, what they do. But Where, with, where with, is the industry going today? Ryan, how are we doing in Canada as an industry? Uh, to be honest, we're, it's pretty great. Uh, is it? Yeah, Ontario in particular has such good tax incentives to allow for American productions to come to Canada that we've got tons of series going on here. I mean, uh, you know, it's like when, when you've got actors who haven't worked in ages or, or whatever, and there's so many different shows that they're still not getting seen for, whatever. There's so many people in this city. There's over 10,000 actors, I think, with, I mean, there's 15, probably 15, 20,000 actors with Actra alone. That's just union wow. performers. Uh, you know, in every age, race, you know, skin color, you know, it doesn't matter what you are. There's so many different performers that, and, and with every project, there's only so many roles that exist so many age categories for those roles and then once you've done one well you're no longer able to do another one unless they bring that character back so there's people who have done guest spots or you know a role you know sometimes they say oh well, i wasted that i wasted that show i did a a two-line role on the listener and i can never do that show again well that two-line role will still build to a four-line or five-line role on let's say suits and suddenly, like, oh, you've got a role in that, and you auditioned really well. We'll give you that role. And then it sort of builds. And then you've got, and that's just, you know, for young performers who are thinking this is the first time they've ever, you know, had this idea of being an actor in the city. It's like, well, it's, it's hard work. I mean, the, the story we tell most people is this. I said, uh, casting directors are given an, a certain allotment of time to hold a session. They have a budget. And so they hire a place like my former space, Casting Link or Casting Central, and they and they say, well, we've got a three-hour a spot where we can see two of the roles or three of the roles. We can only see 10 people per role. So now we're thinking, okay, we've got a category. We're looking for a 30-year-old, but we're going to see people between 25 and 35. It's sort of, you know, younger actors who play older or older actors who play younger. So there's 100 agencies in Toronto. But let's take the top 30 and let's average out that every agency has three agents at them. I mean, because we're an agency that has nine and there's some agencies that have one. Right. So you average it out and you say everyone's got, you know, three agents. Well, every three agents has three performers in that category. They have a 30-year-old, they have a 25-year-old, and they have a 35-year-old, all vying for that one role. So that's three times three is nine. And then you times that by the amount of, uh, so uh, is, uh, is, is nine per agency times 30. Let's take the top 30 times 30. Uh, agencies so that's 270 performers for one role and the casting director is bringing in 10 people so it's like how do you compete with that I mean the casting director knows who is going to audition well who fits that role best and may bring in a new person but likely is going to bring in the people that they can rely on unless they've already done the show right. now you have to be that much better than nine other people to get the part so getting an audition is the job being an actor is auditioning. Working as an actor, being paid as an actor is the prize. Right. 
Uh, are there a lot of American products coming in, you know, shows coming into the city? Absolutely. Are uh, there? Yeah, and across Canada, too. There's big American features that shoot a lot in Montreal. Um, Vancouver's got great shows like the CW shows like Arrow and Once Upon a Time. Uh, one's CW, one's ABC. Uh, Canada, or sorry, Toronto, we've got shows like uh, Suits is an American series or um, what's coming back these days. Um, there's there's a, a number of shows that that are, are even the Canadian shows that get seen on American channels. Uh, shows like Rookie Blue, which I think also coincide on ABC uh, or something like that. And, you know, Flashpoint was on uh, one of the American channels when that was on the air, too. So it's right. like, you know, every show has there's more Canadian shows being seen there, which is great. Oh, Rain is another series that shoots in Canada, shoots in Toronto, which is uh, seen it's seen in the U.S. It's a CW show. So, uh, you know, that's... Are the U.S. shows that are coming into the country casting Canadians in good parts? Or are Absolutely. they just getting the, the lower... There's a mix. I mean, they have an obligation, if they want to take advantage of the tax credits, to put Canadians into big roles. But usually what ends up happening is that those Canadians are people who have already sort of made the transition to the U.S., have big U.S. credits. So... Um, you know, so it basically it's like, uh, yes, they're born in Canada. They may no longer have residence in Canada, but they're technically Canadian who live in L.A. And they're brought back to Canada to shoot these shows. And then the rest of the roles, guest spots or large principal roles, recurring characters end up being Canadians. And then, of course, there's shows where they can afford to bring in, you know, American guest stars. And uh, and even though we fight to submit the right, it's like we've got the great we've got a great guy for that role. I said, yeah, but it's out on offer. Most of the time we have to just assume that they're out on offer even though we submit for those roles. And so that's, that's you know, the, the reality of it. What's the age factor for an actor? When does an, age, an actor become too old to work? Well, I guess technically never because there's technically always a role for someone right. in a cage category. Um, <clears throat> for example, someone like Len Carew, who's been an, a terrific performer for decades, right? He's the original Sweeney Todd on Broadway. And now he plays Tom Selleck's dad on Blue Bloods. You know, it's like, he's sure he's getting older, but, you know, he's still he's still getting at it. William Shatner, Adam West. I mean, like all those guys who, you know, they, they, do, they do appearances nowadays. More often than not, their career is in Comic-Cons and they get paid a lot of money to show up for a weekend to sign autographs for however much money they're going to make. But their careers aren't technically over until they say it's over. They haven't retired, so to speak. I mean, there's jobs out there for them. Adam West recurs on the on, on uh, Family Guy. You know, he plays the mayor of the show. I mean, as a voice character. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, but so is there an end game? Sure. I mean, if you've made enough money that you think you can retire, that's great. But I, I find that performers in general, actors in general, their mentality is is their goal is not to retire. Their life has been to perform. So is there an age? No, I don't think there's an age. Is there a better time to start? Yes. I think that there's a better time to start, even though there are great stories of people being discovered later in life. And there are. There's, you know, the, the woman who was, uh, you know, she was, I think she was one of the secretaries on the West Wing, and she, she started later in life, and she sort of got, she hit her stride later. But... Uh, you know, you can be a 30-something and get your first big role and, and get that. But generally speaking, when you start at 27 years old, you have to take into consideration that there are people who started at 16 who now have 11 years of experience on you. So it's much harder. Right. And when you go to an agency like us who have been established for 49, 45 years, well, we have the opportunity to say, you know what? I, I, we appreciate you submitting and you, you have a great look, but there are agencies who are better suited to starting your career if you're going to start this late. You have, to be, you have to be something special to, and everyone believes they are, and, and I think you need to believe that you're special in order to get somewhere. But, I mean, it's still up to us to, make, to, to decide what we think is special. We're allowed to be wrong. I mean, How much time should you play in, in the U.S.? How much time should, you, should an actor spend trying to get into the U.S. marketplace? I think that a lot of time people find out that they've wasted a lot of money by trying to go there quickly. You need to, if you're a Canadian actor, if you're a Canadian performer, and 
you your end goal is I'm going to be a Hollywood star. Well, a lot of the time, the only way you're ever going to get an agent or manager is if you're extremely young and beautiful or good looking or so special that the one job you ever did was the thing that stood out. That's going to get you somewhere. But again, it's the same thing. Those 27 year olds who are starting 11 years too late or however many years too late against the people they're up against. And in their heads, they're like, I'm going to be a Hollywood star and I'm going to L.A. this year and I'm going to make it. You haven't taken into account you don't have a green card or an, or an O-1 visa or you haven't saved tens of thousands of dollars to spend three months, three months during pilot season or whatever it is to, to land that audition. You don't have representation. You have to fight for it. And of course, those who go down for pilot season, if you don't have representation, you're wasting your time because that's that you need it. You need, I mean, go down in November or December, try to find someone then so that when end of January, February rolls around and that chunk of time comes, that's going to that's going to be the time when you get discovered. But if you go down in the summer when all the TV shows are recording, you're going, oh, I'm going to be on Modern Family. I'm going to get a recurring goal. You don't have a green card. You're not getting that role because it takes weeks to get that t transferred over to getting an O-1 visa alone, yet alone living there for an amount of years just to get the green card. So there's so many stages and steps to get to that next step. You have to be blessed to be either half American. You know, one of your parents is American. That's that's the dream. I mean, I look for performers with that status, absolutely. Mm -hmm. If you've got American status already, you've, you've, you've won the game. You've won the game. Because even if you're based in Toronto, for us submitting on American projects, we can say, hey, they, they're, they're here. But they can tape and no permits. They're American. It's great. Now, New York or L.A.? It depends on what your strengths are. If you're theater, New York. I mean, there's still terrific television there. So even if you're... You're there for theater. You can still be seen for television. Um, but if you're a film and TV person, you go to L.A. That's that's where the shows are. And you can always be brought back to New York. You can always be brought to Atlanta. There's a big community and a lot of shows being shot in Georgia now. It's all tax credits. They bring them out there. The, the states are now starting to compete with each other, too. You know, so, you know, Hollywood talks about runaway production, but right. some of that runaway production is in the U.S. So ultimately, in your mind... What does an actor need, a young person coming up today, need to say to themselves about being, you know, becoming a performer? I think a major part of being a performer now is having a sense of business. You have to be able to understand how to control your career. It is a career and it is a business. Um, a lot of performers who are, they're artistic in nature. They're terrific performers. They can learn lines. They can deliver them well. But if you don't know how to run your life, like a business, because that's what you are. You, As an actor, you are now a product, and you have to be able to sell that product. But you also need to be able to control that product. You need to learn to save for tax season. You know, you have to be able to, you know, properly file your stuff, because often what happens is people get started, and they start to build, and they start to get a career, and they get screwed, because suddenly Revenue Canada or, uh, or uh, the Fed in the U.S. will find you, uh, the IRS, right? IRS. They'll come after you, and they'll... And they'll say you owe tens of thousands of dollars in taxes because you haven't filed anything and we're going to assume they're going to estimate your value. So you need to be a good bookkeeper as well. And even though, I mean, you don't have to. You can get someone to do it, but make sure you have someone in place. You, do, you need it. You need it. Um, and then on top, you need to have goals. And you need to constantly be taking classes. I mean, working performers still take classes. There's great stories of De Niro and Pacino still going back to those same classes, those same technique classes year after year, even though after their career started, where, you know, they just went back and got touch-ups. I mean, actors never stop working. You still take courses at the at Second City. I mean, you understand. There's Your mind never stops, but your, your, uh, your, your gift as a performer never needs to constantly be working, even when you're not. That's it. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for being with us. <clears throat> Ryan Goldhar, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan Goldhar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in for the Tony Rosato Show. I am Tony Rosato. I look forward to seeing you each week. We'll have a special guest for you next week as well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Hey. It's good. Yeah. I interviewed pretty well. Yeah. Interviewed great. 
I uh, spent enough time behind a radio mic. Yeah, it's just <laughs> great. I did that for uh, I did it for a few years. I did radio for a few years. <laughs>